Sure. So can I just like uh, formally, you know, earlier, you know, for those yeah. people who just log in, you know, uh, sorry, we were like uh, chatting about, you know, situations in Hong Kong and in Singapore, but I think I should formally introduce uh, Dr. Wei Yuzhang. Okay, so uh, on behalf of the Center for Media and Communication Research at Hong Kong Baptist University, we are very happy to have Dr. Zhang Weiyu here to share her latest work on civil tech and its relevance in communication research. So uh, Dr. Zhang is an associate professor in the Department of Communications and New Media at the National University of Singapore. She is also the founding director of the Civil Tech Lab, but earlier we were making fun that why she used old technology like this one. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the past 10 years or more than that, uh, Dr. Zhang's research work can be broadly classified into three areas, which include political deliberation, internet use and civic engagement in Asia, and the social psychology of emergent media behaviors. Some of you may have you know, cited her research on deliberation, and others may have read her book, The Internet and the New Social Formation in China, Fandom Publics in the Making, which has been published both in English and in Chinese. And uh, in recent years, Dr. Zhang's research projects converge into a very important and rapidly growing area, which is the applications and impacts of civic tech. So today, uh, it is our honor to have her here in a rainy day. My background you know, is fake, okay, uh, to learn more about her latest research on civic tech and Asian perspective. Let's welcome uh, Wei Yu. Okay, now I pass the microphone to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Leah. Uh, really, I'm very glad uh, to, to be here, and it's a great honor uh, to be invited by Leanne, an old friend, also a very inspiring uh, colleague, uh, to join this talk. I know uh, there are other speakers uh, who are uh, uh, very uh, prominent scholars in the field. I'm very humbled to be a part of this a series of research talk. And uh, many years ago, I actually graduated from uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. So every time I speak at a Hong Kong institution, it brings back those uh, good memories, <laughs> the young, uh, younger years of myself uh, in Hong Kong. So very, very grateful to be here and also very excited uh, to share a new research direction I'm pursuing now, which is basically civic tech. Okay, let me now uh, share a screen with all of you. Uh, oh, uh, host, uh, this, uh, can maybe uh, the host uh, make me a co-host so I can share my screen. Right, and for, for actually, I, I am very um, quite glad to have a smaller audience. You know, I feel a lot more relaxed <laughs> when I face a smaller audience and we can probably discuss uh, some very interesting, uh, you know, have some interesting discussions with the intimate uh, atmosphere. All right, let me uh, start my uh, sharing. Um, so as uh, Lian just uh, said, uh, I'm um, now the so-called director of uh, the Civic Tech Lab, right? So uh, the lab actually has been there for a while, uh, but it wasn't uh, able to have its representation to the world only until recently, thanks to uh, the funding that comes from two grantors. So I like to start my talk by acknowledging <laughs> the grantors uh, support. Uh, so first one is NU NUS ODPRT collaborative uh, grant that supports this uh, civic tech in Asia project. Uh, second is NUS University of Sydney partnership grant, uh, which allows us to go beyond uh, just Asia and to go to Australia uh, as uh, another site of our research, right? So as I said before, uh, Civic Tech Lab has been there uh, since 2008, but we only recently launched our website. So you're welcome to check out our website and see whether there are any uh, research projects that interest you. Uh, if there are, you are welcome to contact me for any uh, collaborations. Uh, well, we also have two other channels other than our website. We have a Twitter channel, Civic Tech L, uh, and a YouTube channel, the Civic Tech Lab. There has already been some content, I think very interesting content on these two channels. Uh, so uh, you can check out uh, the, the Twitter and YouTube channels as well. Um, I also have a short video to introduce our lab uh, to the audience. Um, now uh, let me uh, play it. Can you, can you hear the sound? Okay. Thank you. 
What is civic tech? Civic tech refers to solutions that involve information and communication technologies to benefit citizens. Who are we? We are academics researching and facilitating civic tech processes and technologies. Our vision. We envision taking an interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral, and collaborative approach to tackling civic challenges. Our missions. Generate the highest quality research about civic technology. Strengthen the civic core of public sector, private sector actors and citizens. Design critical processes and technologies for the public good. Our team, Civic Tech Lab at National University of Singapore is a research hub. Our team includes social scientists, computer scientists and digital cultural analysts. Our history, the Civic Tech Lab, formerly known as the Media Psychology Lab, was established in 2008 as a central location for research projects on civic engagement and information communication technology. Our focus, Civic Tech in Asia, Citizen Science, Online Deliberation, Digital Culture. Our home, www.civictechlab.org. All right, so that's basically us, uh, you know, to give you a sense about uh, our lab. And uh, now it's an overview of today's talk. So uh, today's talk will be uh, made up by two major parts, uh, basically two studies. So in the first uh, part, uh, I'm going to give you a field uh, literature review using ACM, a digital library, on the topic of uh, civic tech. Uh, in the second part of the talk, um, I'm going to introduce uh, two Asian studies. One is uh, Singapore and the other one is Japan. Okay, so for uh, many of you, um, I don't know uh, whether you have ever heard of civic tech before. Uh, I know some clicks came to me and say, uh, what is uh, civic tech, right? Uh, well, uh, there isn't uh, a very good academic or normative definition of civic tech yet. So what I am going to introduce now are uh, basically understandings I collected from practitioners who uh, claim that they are doing civic tech projects, right? What do they imagine and understand civic tech? So civic tech uh, as a term has two words, right? Civic and tech, technology. So what is tech is actually quite uh, straightforward. Technology here refers to information and communication technologies that have become popular since the late 20th century. So here we are talking about uh, uh, computers, uh, the internet, mobile phones, and all those uh, technologies built upon these uh, 20th century uh, ICTs. Right? So uh, what is actually more controversial uh, in this definition is uh, what we mean by civic. Um, I looked through a practitioner's uh, own understandings of the civic. I realized that they are actually talking about things from different layers. I came up with this hierarchy of uh, civic uh, to try to understand the layered definitions. So the bottom layer, also called the uh, most common denominator layer of civic, refers to uh, for the citizens. Right. If the tech is for the citizens, so it can be called civic tech. Well, uh, then uh, even with this uh, most basic understanding that comes to uh, with uh, quite a few uh, disagreements, right? For instance, uh, when we say for the citizens, who can actually be qualified uh, to be considered as citizens? Uh, immigrants, especially uh, illegal immigrants, uh, citizens, uh, public servants, for instance, citizens, right? Um, another so-called disagreement regarding this layer comes from uh, for the good of uh, citizens, right? When we say for citizens, we are trying to benefit citizens. We don't uh, really mean to hurt citizens. But uh, the dis disagreement uh, lies in that what actually is good for citizens? Who can decide what is good for the citizens? Okay, so that's the layer, the bottom layer. The second layer of this uh, civic, right? Um, often refers to uh, involving or engaging citizens in developing and implementing civic tech by the citizens. So if, if we want to engage citizens, uh, well, the natural question becomes how, right? How do you want to engage them? In what way, right? Through what channels? Which kind of decision power you are going to give to the citizens, right? So these are all uh, so-called contentious points uh, when it comes to uh, the definition of the civic. 
on the top of the hierarchy, uh, the tip uh, of the hierarchy is a, a particular way of engaging citizen. Uh, that's basically democratic uh, engagement. Uh, well, but even by saying we want to engage uh, citizens in a democratic way, so the technology can be called civic, um, you know, there are different democratic models to follow, right? Uh, if we're talking about electoral democracy, right, it basically means that, uh, well, uh, the citizens will elect their delegates and the delegates will decide uh, which kind of technology will be benefiting the citizens, right? Or uh, if we're talking about a deliberative democracy uh, model, we probably mean that we have to uh, invite the citizens to rationally discuss with each other and mutually come up with decisions. So uh, by introducing to you this uh, rather so-called uh, controversial uh, definition of uh, civic tech, um, but uh, there is one thing that's uh, uh, rather less uh, controversial, right? So the less controversial of the civic tech phenomenon is that we know that uh, civic tech has grown um, uh, rapidly and globally. So uh, the civic tech uh, phenomenon is not just a global, but it's also cross-sectoral, uh, involving different kinds of actors. Um, this is a website, uh, civictech.guide, uh, is a website that aggregates all kinds of uh, civic tech projects. On this website, you can find already over 4,000 civic tech projects uh, around the globe, right? So uh, we uh, look through these uh, projects. We also, um, uh, through our own research, uh, um, well, roughly come up with uh, three different kinds of uh, civic tech or civic tech actors, right? So the first type is basically GovTech, technologies built by the government to serve uh, the citizens. The second type uh, of civic tech, I will call them uh, CSO tech, right? Or civil society organization tech. So these kind of technologies uh, are meant to serve or to empower civil society organizations or NGOs or charities to do their work better. The last type of uh, civic tech uh, actors, I will call them uh, civic tech entities, right? So these are the entities that primarily rely on building technological tools to solve all kinds of uh, civic challenges uh, and issues. All right, so now uh, I'm going to give you some uh, examples of each of the three uh, types of uh, civic tech actors uh, to give you a sense about uh, what I mean. Um, well, uh, in uh, November last year, we held a workshop called ICT for Good Asia workshop. Uh, and in the workshop, we actually invited a great variety of civic tech actors to share uh, their experiences. So I draw examples from this workshop to illustrate the three types of uh, civic tech actors. The first type of uh, civic tech actor is definitely GovTech. Actually, the government has built numerous pieces of uh, civic technology, meaning that technologies are aimed uh, to serve uh, the citizens, right? So in the workshop, we had uh, Yang Ling. Yang Ling is a director in digital design and development from the Singapore government agency called GovTech. GovTech is a Singapore agency that's uh, in charge of uh, developing all kinds of technologies for the citizens. So uh, Yang Ling actually has given quite a few good examples of uh, GovTech. Um, so uh, some of the GovTech uh, initiatives are meant to serve um, the government itself, right? To make the government run faster, more smoother, and have better coordinations among various uh, governmental agencies. So we have here um, an example called uh, Booking SG. Booking SG is a mobile application booking system that's only available to the government. Right? So government officials can actually use this system to share facilities to take uh, uh, the full advantage of what other governmental uh, agencies are able to, to provide. Right? So it's a resource sharing kind of technology among the governmental employees themselves. Right? Um, another type of uh, GovTech um, that has been developed is basically those uh, technologies facing the citizens by trying to serve or benefit the citizens. Another good example we have here uh, is um, XGoWare. Uh, there are many kind of uh, XGoWare 
uh, websites in, in Singapore. We have uh, mask, go wear, <laughs> vaccine, go wear. So these are just information sites to provide citizens information about where you can go to find resources, where you can go for your mask, your vaccination, the clinics that uh, treat the COVID, right? So, uh, so this uh, is another type of uh, so-called uh, tech the government builds in order to serve uh, the citizens. Uh, well, GovTech uh, aside, the second type of uh, uh, so-called uh, civic tech is uh, CSO tech. CSO or civil society organizations, right, refer to technologies that can actually help those existing NGOs and charities to do their work better. Uh, in our workshop, we have Dong Xie, uh, the Secret uh, Secretary General uh, from NGO 2.0 uh, in China, right? So uh, NGO 2.0 as an organization, I think it's a great illustration of CSO tech, right? So NGO uh, 2.0 um, is actually a pioneer in promoting information and communication technologies among Chinese NGOs. This uh, entity was established uh, by uh, MIT professor Wang Jing as early as in 2009. So NGO 2.0 uh, is a nationwide organization, meaning that they have supported Chinese NGOs from all over China, right, to uh, incorporate uh, information technologies into their daily operation. So NGO 2.0 over the years built uh, a data set that includes NGOs from all over the country. They also drafted a map, a digital map, for people to easily uh, add, uh, uh, locate these organizations. They developed 2.0 tools uh, for the NGOs. They provide training to over uh, 3,000 NGOs, right? So these uh, things they have done basically to empower uh, civil society organizations or NGOs to do their work better. So that's uh, a good example of CSO tech. Um, let me now continue to civic tech entities. Uh, well, uh, even uh, within uh, civic tech entities, there are at least two types of uh, civic tech entities. The one I'm showing you now, uh, well, uh, is different from CSO uh, tech. CSO tech is still trying uh, to empower existing uh, civil society organizations, right? So this kind of uh, civic tech entities actually uh, oftentimes do not exist uh, before the technology is developed and completed, right? So um, uh, in our workshop, we had uh, Nashin Matani. Uh, she is a director from an organization, civic tech entity called Yayasan Peta Bankana. Uh, this is uh, Bahasa, uh, meaning Disaster Map Foundation. Right? So a uh, Disaster Map Foundation is a civic entity uh, basically primarily based on a piece of technology. As you can see in this picture, right? this piece of technology is basically a mobile uh, interface uh, that you can use uh, for community-led disaster co-management, right? So this uh, interface uh, used in uh, Indonesia is a real-time uh, mapping system. Uh, so people can use uh, this real-time mapping uh, system to report uh, various uh, kinds of uh, disasters. And in Indonesia, it was uh, flooding, right? That's the most uh, serious uh, natural disaster. So people can actually uh, uh, identify their location, upload pictures, and leave comments you know, to suggest or to report the severity of the situation in particular uh, locations. There is a team uh, behind the, uh, the system to verify the information that comes from the uh, ordinary users, right? And the information was also shared with governmental ag agencies uh, to take necessary actions. So, uh, this map uh, is uh, not, now not just used in Indonesia. It, it's now also used in the Philippines and Vietnam. Um, well, do you know, uh, I don't know whether you still remember, right, uh, what happened uh, during the Henan uh, flooding in China, right, last year. Uh, there was this uh, life-saving Excel sheet where people actually input information and help each other during the flooding. Imagine that if the Zhengzhou people actually had a, a piece of technology like this. I'm sure that those life-saving uh, efforts will have been made more successful and efficient right, uh, with this kind of a tool. Um, so that's uh, civic tech entity uh, number one. right? Civic tech entity number one basically focused on a particular piece of technology to solve a particular kind of problems. Right? Uh, the 
Civic tech entity number two, the second type of it um, is the community building uh, civic tech organizations, right? Um, in our workshop, we also had a representative from this category. Hong Fa Dang uh, is um, a funder of a community called uh, FOSS Asia. So FOSS Asia uh, stands for Free and Open Software Source Software Asia, right? So this uh, organization uh, is aimed to sustain the open source community in the Asian region. So Hong uh, is uh, from Vietnam and uh, al along with her co-founders and the colleagues, uh, so Force Asia has organized uh, various uh, uh, community events to bring the members together and work with each other. Um, the most uh, important points of uh, Force Asia is that, uh, you know, no matter what they do, they really organize large uh, events, they, their uh, annual uh, summits actually have hundreds of talks, right? No matter what they do, they do it through using open source softwares, right? So even with hundreds of talks during that Force Asia summit, they purely rely on uh, open source software to organize the entire, uh, the entire event, okay? So uh, I think I have uh, given you some basic senses about uh, civic tech uh, uh, and different kinds of civic tech actors. Um, now, um, if I may, uh, I'm uh, ready to move into my academic studies. Uh, the first study we did was to try to uh, review the field, right? the academic field that's relevant uh, to civic tech uh, through uh, doing a comprehensive literature review. Okay? Um, well, um, we decided to uh, search through uh, one particular data source uh, that says uh, ACM Digital Library. The reason why we're doing this is because um, that's the place where you find uh, computer scientists and their works. Uh, when it comes to academic research, building and implementing civic tech, computer scientists are the ones who have uh, made a lot of efforts uh, in this regard. So we decided to use ACM Digital Library right, to search through uh, uh, the database. What we did was we searched through uh, their full text uh, connection using one keyword, civic, uh, in titles, abstracts, and also keywords. Uh, we didn't set a starting date, but the ending date was around July last year. So this initial search uh, ended up with uh, 496 uh, entries. Uh, we excluded further um, those short page, short uh, papers, right? Papers with say, seven pages or fewer, as well as some of the inappropriate uh, papers. We ended up with a corpse of uh, 224 uh, articles, full papers. Okay, so we also uh, designed a code book to uh, somehow code uh, all these uh, 224 papers. Uh, we had uh, a coding team of two graduate students, uh, one from computer science and one from uh, social science. So uh, the training process uh, was uh, completed on a random subset of articles from the COPS. After three rounds of training sessions, uh, the two coders uh, managed to reach uh, satisfactory uh, intercoder reliability as calculated uh, using Krippendorf's alpha. All right, so that's the method we have used uh, to do this comprehensive literature review and analysis. Here are some of the results. Uh, let me share with you first, uh, where uh, were these uh, civic tech papers uh, published and from when, right? So uh, you can see that the civic tech uh, publications have already appeared uh, for about uh, 21 years, okay, two decades, uh, with an average about four papers per year. Um, as early uh, as in 2001, uh, that was the first civic tech paper uh, seen in ACW, right? And in 2012, uh, you see that there was a jump, right? From uh, three papers to 12 papers. And since, since then, since 2012, uh, there were double digit uh, papers every year published uh, in AC, ACM, right? Um, one interesting observation was uh, since 2020, we started to see uh, review papers and the critical essays on the topic of civic tech. This probably signals that the, the field has uh, reached a certain stage uh, of maturity. All right, uh, in terms of the venues, where do you find uh, the publications? Uh, there were uh, 
five uh, top venues in ACW. Uh, the first one is uh, computer human interaction, CHI, uh, computer supported cooperative work, CSCW, conference on digital government research, DG.O, and conference on digital interactive systems, DIS, a lastly conference on theory and practice of electronic governance, ISCAF. Right? So uh, as you can see that, uh, you know, these top venues uh, suggest that uh, starting from the beginning of civic tech and throughout the development of civic tech scholarship, well, uh, there is always a perspective of government or governance, okay? Um, now let me continue to uh, the so-called issues. Uh, these uh, civic tech studies have focused on issues refer to the problems or challenges uh, regarding civic matters the technologies are supposed to, to solve, right? So uh, the range of issues uh, is quite large, but um, the most frequent issue uh, is here, uh, accounting to for uh, more than 40% of all the issues is to, uh, to, to figure out how to use technology to uh, pr promote democracy and participation in uh, political decision-making, right? Uh, then um, uh, the second most uh, frequent uh, issue is public service and governance issues. These uh, issues include um, how to provide services to the citizens or how to involve uh, publics and in policy making by the governments. Okay. Um, the high, third highest uh, so-called uh, frequently uh, seen issue uh, is actually to figure out how to use technologies to disseminate useful information and fight fake news, right? Uh, following that, we have uh, issues of urban planning or neighborhood, both of which uh, tend to focus on local communities and local matters. There are specific issue areas uh, that focus on education, minority groups, uh, sustainability, crime, and uh, disaster, right? But relatively few. So these are the issues uh, covered in civic tech uh, uh, studies. Now uh, you probably wonder then which kind of technologies uh, are actually used in addressing these issues. Well, the most popular technology, as you can see here, is still websites or web-based uh, applications and platforms. Right. Um, well, but interestingly, uh, following that, uh, the second most popular technology that has been developed or used is actually existing commercial social media uh, and forums, right? So these uh, technologies are ad adapted by the computer scientists to address uh, civic issues. Following that, we have mobile phones and mobile applications. Um, then after that, another uh, interesting uh, category, right, of uh, technologies is something we didn't really expect uh, is physical devices. Physical devices uh, that such as uh, public displays, big screens, right? Uh, installed uh, in uh, locations and local communities. So the computer scientists, they wanted to reduce uh, the access barrier uh, for the community members to use the technologies. So they decided to just put the, 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 the physical devices in the neighborhood. So when the neighbors uh, pass through, they can quickly use it and interact with the devices. All right. Uh, well, a recent trend uh, since 2012, we have seen what we call data set papers, right? Well, they, they don't really build te technologies, but they use public data from Twitter, from Facebook to analyze uh, civic issues, to try to contribute to the solutions, okay? So these are the civic tech uh, kind of uh, uh, technologies, right? We have observed from our, ob uh, from our analysis. Um, then who are the ones who actually pay for uh, civic tech development? Who are the funders and partners? We have two colors of uh, columns here. Uh, the blue color uh, refers to funders. The orange color refers to partners. As you can see, the biggest funder of civic tech is actually government. Government is the one who pays for uh, civic tech. Uh, following that, foundations and universities uh, also contribute to it. Right? Uh, well, companies, as you can see, or private corporates or the industry, uh, you know, although they're quite rich, right, they are also very technologically capable, but they haven't contributed that much uh, to civic tech. Well, uh, uh, this reminds me of uh, all these uh, tech for good uh, 
talk, you know, you can see uh, in the IT industry. Uh, I think that they can definitely have uh, a lot of more work to do, right, uh, to help uh, civic tech. Um, well, uh, organizations and the communities are often uh, poor. They don't have that much money. Uh, they, are, they often provide support by functioning as partners, right, not funders. So this uh, graph is a little bit similar to the previous graph, but uh, it emphasis, uh, emphasizes the two different kinds of uh, actors that are very important to civic tech or actually any tech, right? So designers and users. Well, uh, I won't go into the details, you know, by just looking at the graph, you know, remotely, uh, you can see uh, a pattern, right? A pattern of division. Um, basically those who are designing the technologies oftentimes are not the users. Right? The users don't design the technologies that they are supposed to use every day. Right? The designers don't use the technology uh, they design. Okay? Uh, there is a potential gap uh, if there is a division like that. Um, all right, um, this is quite interesting, at least to me as a researcher. Right? So um, I, we look through all these uh, civic tech uh, projects and try to figure out how they actually uh, involve, uh, sorry, involved citizens or how do they actually engage citizens in their design models, right? Well, uh, there are different kinds of design models uh, and the level of uh, participation and engagement uh, was also different across these models. Uh, we see uh, models uh, such as user-centered design or even iterative design. Uh, this kind of design models uh, tend to see um, participants or the users as owning sources of uh, information, right? So they will uh, conduct uh, surveys and interviews to understand the so-called user needs or user requirements uh, regarding the technologies. And there might be a few runs of back and forth between uh, the designers and the users, but most of the time the users are only supposed to provide their needs, right? I need uh, a bottle, <laughs> uh, but uh, they will have no input uh, in how to design the bottle, which kind of materials uh, we, we use to, to, to make the bottle, right? All these decisions are still made by the designers or the tech experts, right? So that's one uh, so-called type of uh, uh, design model. We also have other design models that have a significant higher level of participation from the users, right? So we have participatory design and co-design models. These models actually treat uh, the citizens as uh, equally an, uh, ex ex experts, right? As those uh, who build the technologies. So those uh, designers may have uh, expertise in technology building, but citizens are considered the, as experts who have a firsthand experience, who also have lifelong insights into the civic issues the technologies are supposed to solve. Right? So uh, in this kind of uh, design models, um, you know, uh, not only surveys and interviews are used, but also workshops right, and other for, uh, forms of uh, seminars that involve uh, both uh, designers and users at the same time will be used. And designers and users will work hand in hand throughout the whole process of coming up with uh, a tool right, to address a civic issue. Okay. Um, all right, I'm going to uh, uh, complete my summary with uh, this, this last piece of information. So where do you find these uh, civic technology studies? Uh, as many of you uh, expect, right? Um, the wealthiest part of the world still dominates uh, civic tech studies, right? Uh, United States, uh, UK, Europe are leaving the other uh, parts of the world with a big margin. So there were only 13% of the studies uh, that came from uh, Asia and uh, Asia Pacific, right? Australia, including Australia and New Zealand. So uh, what can we say? There is still a lot uh, for the academics in the re Asian region to do uh, with regards to civic tech. Um, a quick summary of, uh, of our findings, um, academic research uh, over the years has uh, grown exponentially on the topic of civic tech. Uh, there are a variety of civic issues being addressed, but the major interest is still on democracy and how we can engage citizens in polit political decision making, right? Uh, a large variety of technology have been used uh, in these projects. Um, what we have found uh, that uh, seems to be missing is a close interaction or closer interaction between uh, funders, uh, partners, right? 
And when we look at the design models and the participation mechanisms, we think that users or citizens can play um, even more active roles in the design of safe tech. Lastly, you know, research from uh, global sites, including the Asian region, uh, definitely needs uh, to be further developed. All right, so that's our rather a uh, little bit boring, full of numbers <laughs> part of this talk. And, you know, we're done with that. Um, now uh, uh, I'm going to move into the second, the so-called the second study we have done, which is basically to use uh, cases from Asia to understand uh, whether there is actually an Asian perspective in the phenomenon of civic technology, right? So in this uh, study, uh, we use a different method, a method. I say um, that might be very similar to what historians <laughs> do in their own work, right? So uh, I rely largely on secondhand documents. So uh, academic books, uh, publications, right? Uh, do uh, documents from the government, uh, media interviews, media reports, even online archival data. I, I, did, I, I do uh, visit uh, all these organizations, <laughs> Facebook accounts, I dig into their albums, right? <laughs> Try to find as much uh, information as possible, right? So, uh, but uh, I'm not really trying to so-called discover um, a set of uh, past effects because all these documents are constructions, right? By the actors themselves, right? Uh, so um, what I'm doing, I think, is more like a construction of uh, these actors' uh, historical constructions, right? Uh, through reading their uh, historical constructions, I was trying uh, to identify a few things, entities, right? and organizations involved in civic tech, metaphors they are using to describe their work, uh, technologies, the concrete pieces of technologies uh, they actually have built, right? and lastly, the people, right? people behind these uh, technologies, uh, people running these entities. Okay, so. Um, let me start from the case of uh, Singapore. Um, well, as uh, many of you know, right, uh, the government in Singapore uh, takes a very strong leadership uh, in directing the country's uh, ICT development, right? Um, well, uh, it is uh, shown in uh, seven in the seven uh, information technology master plans issued by the government since 1981. So I went uh, into these uh, so-called documents, master plans to look for metaphors. Uh, here are some of the examples, right? These metaphors include computerization, uh, intelligent island, intelligent nation, and smart nation, so on and so forth, right? So when you read into these uh, metaphors, you realize that uh, there is a common um, kind of understanding or idea behind these metaphors. That's basically emphasizing a progressive development right, of technology. So these progressive developments also emphasizes economic benefits, right, how the technologies can actually help the economy, economy to grow and bring more jobs to the country. Right? So Elvin Ning actually uh, is a local scholar. The local scholar also read uh, into these metaphors. So she found that uh, you know, the, all these metaphors are deeply rooted in the construction of a Singaporean nation. So the nation building discourse uh, changed over time uh, from emerging out of a post-colonial society to catching up in late modernity uh, and uh, further to leading, uh, therefore never being left behind again, the country uh, into a utopian future. So the metaphors um, basically emphasize progresses and the technologies, uh, uh, the progresses brought by the technologies, as well as emphasizes the future, right? For the future, we have to develop these technologies, okay? Um, next, uh, I'm going to share with you some of the concrete technologies actually built uh, by the government over the years, right? So I, I chose an example called SingPass. SingPass, uh, is of critical uh, uh, technology, right? Because it's a citizen side uh, of the digital identity system, right? Um, so citizens will use this digital identity to access government services. Um, the first uh, 
so-called uh, iteration of uh, uh, SingPass is actually a website. The website was launched in 2003. And uh, you know, with one single password, um, people log into the system, uh, then they can access all kinds of services from different government agencies, right? In the middle, you see uh, another so-called iteration of SingPass. That's a physical token called a SingPass One Key, right? So <clears throat> this physical token was launched in 2011. Uh, it allows people uh, to log into SingPass using a two-factor authentication, right? So it basically, it's a device that makes uh, SingPass more secure to use. Um, however, uh, starting from April uh, 2021, last year, uh, these uh, physical tokens uh, were eliminated by the government. So everyone now has to use a mobile application called SingPass Mobile, the last picture here, right? And the SingPass Mobile actually allows you to uh, log in using a password, using SMS, uh, one-time ping, using fingerprints, using face verifications. But uh, you probably notice that without a mobile phone, <laughs> there's no way actually for you to use uh, this uh, SingBow, uh, SingPass uh, mobile. Uh, I think it's a good illustration, uh, illustration of uh, how uh, the metaphor of technological development focuses on so-called the fast evolving, always going forward kind of progress, right? So um, the sense uh, is that uh, the newer technologies are always better than the older technologies, right? Um, you know, the newer uh, mobile application SingPass is supposed to make, uh, you know, the logging uh, safer, more convenient, easier to the citizens. But all these convenience has a presumption, right? The presumption is first, you have a fully functional mobile phone, right? Second, you actually know how to use uh, all the functions you've found on the mobile phones. Um, all right, so I'll stop there. You know, I think these two, uh, the, these examples uh, uh, can already illustrate maybe uh, the kind of a mindset behind uh, the GAF side of uh, civic tech development. Um, now, let me uh, turn to the more social side of civic tech development in Singapore. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned before, there are two kinds of civic tech entities. One is the community building ones, like the ones here, right? Social Computer, uh, sorry, Singapore Computer Society actually was established in 1967. Um, uh, the Internet Society Singapore chapter was uh, approved in 2011. Uh, we have hackerspace uh, in 2009. After that, uh, multiple makerspaces. Right. So uh, we do have uh, the community building entities present uh, in the country. In terms of uh, the so-called particular technologies right, used to, to solve a particular problems, that kind of uh, civic tech entities, uh, there were actually not many. So I tried my best to search for these entities and only found the most prominent uh, examples, the most visible cases. Right. So I list three such cases here. Uh, engineering Good uh, is actually an uh, NGO, right? Uh, Data Kind SG is a private company. Uh, Goodhood, as far as I know, uh, is a grown up initiative, right? So these uh, first two were established in 2014. Goodhood uh, was launched in 2020, okay? Let me now show you some of the technologies these uh, organizations or entities built, okay? So you can see a difference. Uh, the two pictures here came from Engineering Good. Uh, Engineering Good run a long-term uh, project, uh, which is to repair old laptops and give the old laptops to the people who need it. Okay, that's the first picture. The second picture uh, is a project uh, run by Engineering Good called Salvage Garden. So what is Salvage Garden? It's basically a project that develops assistive technologies that help the disabled people. In this picture, you have an example of a big button uh, mouse, right? So with big button and switches, uh, disabled people can control the mouse more easily, okay? So these are the technologies uh, built by um, so-called engineering good, right? And the second picture shows you um, the uh, Data SG um, uh, initiative, right? Data SG, basically gathered volunteers uh, to train them and run hackathons uh, where various inviting 
all kinds of uh, CSOs and NGOs to join. So they worked with uh, Red Cross, uh, Singapore Children's Society to first understand which kind of data they have, right? Then uh, to uh, actually help them uh, to uh, make use of these data, to make sense of these data. So that's basically um, Data SG. Um, Goodhood, Goodhood is a mobile application developed by an individual. So Goodhood, um, the mobile application allow neighborhood members to uh, not only request, but also offer um, items and services. For instance, um, you can say I'm available between five to 6 p.m. to help you to walk your dog, right? So it allows neighbors to actually find each other to, to, to somehow uh, co coordinate with themselves, right? So uh, this kind of uh, project is aimed to bring back maybe the so-called community spirit uh, we used to see in pre-modern uh, communities. Okay, so I, I went through uh, news reports, uh, websites, uh, information, Facebook posts of these projects to try to find so-called their methods. Um, well, uh, I noticed uh, three things. Uh, the first one is, uh, well, uh, these uh, civic tech uh, initiatives, uh, they do not always look into the future or look forward. Uh, they look backwards or uh, they look at the present. They want to solve the problems immediately, right? Uh, they don't want to wait till the future when everything can be solved, or every problem can be solved, right? Uh, second, um, well, they do not always advocate for the most innovative technologies. They actually use a lot of old technologies. Uh, including um, those technologies that are very accessible in the current market, right? Uh, lastly, uh, although uh, not all of them are uh, non-profits or non-government organizations, uh, but um, most of them do not really attempt to make big money, right? Many of those volunteers actually uh, work for uh, private corporates, right? Uh, they make their money <laughs> over there. They don't really uh, make money from their volunteering. So that's my uh, description of the Singaporean case. Uh, now I think it's time to move into um, the Japan case. Uh, the Japan case, um, I had to first acknowledge that uh, the Japan case was led by my collaborator, Ling Taiwei from uh, East Asia Institute. Right? We learned a lot from his research work about Japan. Right? Um, well, the Japan case um, is slightly different. Um, I like to uh, focus on one particular civic tech initiative from Japan uh, called Code for Japan to illustrate uh, this case. Well, Code for Japan or the so-called Code for XYZ organizations uh, was actually not really originated uh, from Japan, right? Uh, Code for XYZ groups uh, were, was uh, born uh, in the United States in 2009. Uh, now, all these code for XYZ chapters uh, were spread all over the world, including Africa, okay? So uh, these, uh, a brief history of these uh, code for uh, organizations. Uh, these uh, organizations first were uh, volunteer groups, right? Um, for technologists. So these uh, people sometimes overlap with uh, the hacker and maker communities. Uh, later on, uh, some of these uh, codes for groups as uh, following the opening up of the American government, right, was able to become vendors and contractors for the governments, right? Some of these uh, codes for uh, group members uh, even joined the governments uh, to become uh, insiders, right, to work from inside the government, okay? So a uh, code for Japan itself was funded in 2013 and uh, located in Tokyo, right? And then since then, uh, Code for Japan chapters have spread it all over the country, right? There were Code for Kyoto, Code for Hokkaido, Code for Osaka, almost every single big city uh, has uh, a Code for chapter, right? So I go to Code for Japan and try to understand their ideas and mindset um, when they talk about civic tech, right? And I noticed one keyword that's called co-creation. So this uh, is from uh, Code for Japan's own introduction. Code for Japan tries to um, basically alert or remind the public that uh, it's not solely the government or the authorities' responsibility to solve community issues, right? So their mission is actually to bring 
uh, citizens, corporates, and the local governments together to create solutions. So the responsibility as well as the capacity uh, is distributed among the three different kinds of actors. And Code for Japan acts as a center or, or the hub, right, to join the forces from the three different kinds of actors. All right, so uh, that's uh, what I think um, an interesting metaphor, co-creation um, used by Code for Japan. Uh, when it comes to the concrete pieces of technologies uh, Code for Japan has built over the years, there are many, actually there are so many, numerous uh, technologies. Uh, but I will uh, focus on the technologies they built during uh, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. So there's this picture here you see um, is uh, one of the first information uh, sites uh, that uh, has been available in Japan. Uh, this uh, information site uh, shows the users or the visitors, the number of inf infections, the number of texts in the Tokyo area uh, through uh, some of the infographics, right? Um, this site was actually built by uh, Code for Japan under the request from the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, okay? And it started operation uh, as early as in March, 2020. Uh, one thing, again, very interesting about this information site is that uh, the entire system was built upon open source uh, codes and the programs. Uh, for that reason, this uh, system can be uh, very quickly replicated by other uh, designers. So uh, this uh, open source template e uh, eventually leads to 57 spin-off sites in Japan, right? Almost all over, over Japan. So that's basically um, this uh, information technology, uh, information site, uh, Code for Japan built. Another uh, story that emerged during the pand pandemic in Japan, I think it's even more interesting, uh, is a tale of two contract tracing applications. Um, you know, in many of the countries here, right? In Singapore, we have just one <laughs> a contract tracing app, Trace Together, right? And uh, that one uh, app was developed by GovTech and uh, also um, somehow uh, triggered uh, controversial discussions uh, due to its compulsory usage, right? Uh, but instead of uh, one contact tracing app, you actually have two contact tracing apps seen in Japan. On your left-hand side, you have Mamori Japan. Uh, Mamori Japan uh, is the contact tracing app built by Code for Japan, okay? So Code for Japan answered re the request from one of the doctors uh, in a major Tokyo hospital about you know, this need. So they quickly uh, gathered uh, 50 highly skilled uh, volunteers who have uh, worked with uh, Code for Japan before to build this uh, contact tracing app, right? Uh, the contact tracing app was launched in May, 2020, uh, you know, even before uh, the government launched its own contact tracing app. So on your right hand side, you see a, a official contact tracing app called COCOA. Uh, COCOA was actually um, you know, introduced or launched by the government for nationwide usage. Uh, but an interesting backstory to this is um, when COCOA was built, a code for Japan actually shared their codes, again, open source codes, uh, as well as uh, you know, the the lessons and knowledge learned through building Mamori Japan with COCOA. However, when COCOA completed its own uh, launching, um, Mamori Japan uh, voluntarily uh, retired into a very periphery kind of a status. So you have uh, a very interesting case here in Japan, whereas uh, on the one hand, uh, Code for Japan uh, manages to build a critical piece of technology, right? Uh, on the other hand, it seems that the Japan central government uh, is willing to allow them at first try to build uh, a, a contact tracing app, and second, um, and to trust them enough to incorporate some of their codes in the nationwide official uh, contact tracing app. Okay, so uh, this particular tale of two uh, apps really makes me wonder, right? Why does the Japanese central government trust code for Japan so much? I asked uh, my collaborator, Dr. Uh, Ling, uh, a lot of times this question. Uh, so uh, here is an initial answer uh, we have. 
Well, um, it signifies that, uh, you know, the central government of Japan seems to have uh, been embracing Code for Japan, a civic tech entity into their inner circle, right? They now treat them as inside the bureaucracy. Uh, this is the result of a long-term relationship built uh, over the years. So a Code for Japan uh, has already started uh, working with local governments uh, when natural disasters uh, happened, especially during the 2011 earthquake. So during the earthquake, Code for Japan were the ones who quickly come up with uh, technological tools that help the government and the communities to manage the disasters, right? And over the years, um, uh, working with local governments as uh, vendors and contractors, right? Uh, Code for Japan also managed to sustain themselves from this collaboration with local governments, okay? So, and as we know, the Japanese bureaucracy um, is actually a professional bureaucracy that doesn't really change their policy directions uh, very easily. Although politicians come and go through elections, their bureaucracy is actually quite stable, okay? So by building this long-term relationship with the bureaucracy, right, Code for Japan was uh, able to somehow break into the inner circle of the governance, government uh, and uh, become a trustworthy partners in critical technologies like contact tracing, okay? So I'm going to uh, conclude a very, very uh, brief and initiative, uh, initial uh, conclusions regarding what we see uh, from the two cases. Well, what we see from the two cases, I can uh, roughly say that, well, uh, maybe there are two types of government and society co-driven, right? Uh, civic tech development. In Singapore, you see that the government uh, drives all the major critical mainstream essential civic tech developments, such as ID systems, contact tracing systems, right? Um, the civic tech entities actually drive the supplementary development of technologies that uh, benefit and serve minority groups. Um, civic tech uh, entities uh, work on basically areas the government does not really have the bandwidth to take care of uh, in Singapore. Well, in Japan, it is interesting to see that the code for Japan is actually allowed right, uh, to develop a piece of uh, critical technology such as contact tracing. Well, it is also almost unimaginable to, to me, right, who, who has been living in Singapore for more than uh, 14 years. Um, so um, other than, you know, uh, you drive your <laughs> technological development, I drive mine, you, we see in the Japan case that uh, both uh, the government and the civic uh, tech entities are driving towards the same direction, right? So it's a rare moment, I think, of true collaboration or between the two sides of the civic tech phenomenon, okay? And I think this uh, may have to do with the long-term relationship between uh, the government and the, and the civic tech entities, as well as the trust, the mutual trust between the two. Okay, so uh, let me finish my talk today. You know, uh, you probably it's your first time to, sit, to hear about civic tech. I hope you have uh, got a, a basic idea about what civic tech is. Uh, it's a phenomenon, it's also an academic uh, research field, right? So um, through uh, uh, reviewing the literatures, we know that academics still have lots of space to explore um, in conducting research in the Asian region. And the Asian region has its own unique political and economic circumstances that condition the development of civic tech. You know, if I can end uh, my message, uh, my presentation as a take home message, I'm going to say that civic tech is still a very promising me uh, field for uh, researchers as well as practitioners to work together, right? Uh, the co-creation uh, approach uh, uh, still has a lot of uh, space uh, to work into. I'm going to now stop my presentation. Uh, you know, here are my personal contact. Uh, you're welcome to contact me if you have any follow-up questions. All right, uh, Lian, back to you. Thank you, Wei Yu, for the very, very you know, uh, informative you know, uh, presentation. Okay, I can see that the majority of our audience are our uh, postgraduate students. So thanks for the great lecture <laughs> to our students. Um, now we open the floor for uh, questions. So uh, anyone, uh, if you have questions, you can uh, type in the chat box or you, know, you can just 
uh, turn on your microphone and uh, ask the questions, please. And while based on my understanding of our students, usually, you know, they may, you know, uh, it may take a while for them to, you know, form the questions. I do have the question for you, or you perhaps, you know, not, not the question, but then it is more like, you know, uh, asking for clarification. Because earlier, you know, in the first part of your presentation, you show us, you know, your, uh, um, you know, the literature review that you've done. Uh, by searching the ACM library, right? So I guess, you know, our students may have this, you know, uh, uh, question like, okay, how would, you know, the, how do you label uh, civil tech, you know, research, um, you know, and how is it different from, you know, our traditional understanding of, you know, uh, digital media research? For example, uh, especially, you know, the popular texts that you found are like websites, social media platforms, mobile apps, right? So then, you know, um, maybe, you know, uh, we are confused about, okay, so in what kind, like, you know, scenarios, you would say, oh, this is more like, you know, uh, civil tech related research and then other, you know, um, you know uh, research related to uh, digital media. Are not so. Can you share with us mm. more about you know how you see the differences or you know the overlapping areas or the non-overlapping areas that you know you feel? Thank you. That's that's a great question, right? So it's you're basically asking, uh, how can we differentiate, right? Maybe the academic field called civic tech and the other academic fields maybe called uh, social media <laughs> or uh, websites, right? Um, so how do we differentiate? Uh, it's, it's actually quite uh, challenging because there are indeed very, a lot of overlappings right, between uh, so-called civic tech research and other types of media research, new media research. So what we hoped uh, you know, we can use to, to somehow build a corpse right, on civic tech is to make sure that civic is one keyword, right? the authors themselves use. Right? Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, authors have a vast different kinds of understanding of uh, civic. So uh, they probably think that they are building a piece of civic technology. So they, they, they mentioned that uh, in, their, in their abstract, right? But when we really look at those technologies, they might not really be this kind of uh, civic we understand. So for instance, I can give you an example, right? You know, uh, we actually searched for uh, uh, the papers and one of the papers, uh, you know, claimed to be a piece of civic tech. And if you look closer, it's about water system, right? So it's about uh, how to uh, use some of uh, the algorithm to uh, control the water supply system. So we can make sure that uh, there's no water uh, so-called uh, shortage in certain parts of the, uh, of the, uh, the city, right? So for that particular piece of paper, you know, we really had to just make an arbitrary <laughs> decision that, you know, you think you are running civic uh, tech, but, you know, it hasn't really tapped into, uh, you know, what we think um, uh, is important to civic, right? It's basically to embrace uh, civic venues, right? To, uh, to, to at least uh, uh, recognize uh, the, the, the role or the, the contributions of citizens, right? So, um, yeah, great question. You know, uh, basically, um, that first, there are overlappings right, between the two kinds of, uh, not two kinds of, multiple kinds of uh, studies. Uh, second, you know, uh, I, I think the, the bottom line is we indeed that the, the, the technologies will have to uh, somehow serve the public and serve the citizens and somehow you know, engage the citizens. Right, because if you want to build a research core of this field, then, you know, you, you need to kind of, like, you know, not like we need to have the boundary to be territorial, but then, you know, it may help for people to know that, oh, when I see some kind of, like, you know, tech-related research, how will we know that is civil-related, right? Especially, like, you know, nowadays, you know, like one of the, you know, uh, heated, you know, topics that, okay, how, um, you know, what interventions can the government do to, you know, fight against, you know, the spread of, you know, misinformation, for example. Mm -hmm. So then maybe people are doing this kind of like interventions uh, initiated by the government or organizations mm -hmm. without awareing that actually, you know, they are like, you know, doing some kind of like civic tech you know, education. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, that is why, you know, I think people may have to come, um, you know, mm -hmm. some questions about, you know, what will be related to, you know, civic tech related research. Yeah, but yeah, uh, that's, yeah. that's a great example, right? So fake news, for instance, right? Uh, fake news, uh, there are many studies on fake news, but not everyone see the problem 
like from a civic perspective, right? So uh, they probably, you know, from a government point of view, it's really just, you know, it's disrupting maybe uh, governance, right? So because you all believe that COVID uh, vaccine is dangerous, <laughs> so we don't take COVID vaccine. So, but they, it's, it's, it depends on whether the researchers look at the issues from the civic perspective, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the research, uh, you know, I just mentioned, right? There are quite a few, right? Um, trying to treat the illness of fake news, right? Um, but then we, when, when they describe their efforts, they will say that they are trying to, to do this for the benefits of citizens. At least they can claim uh, for doing so, right? So I guess that's uh, how our search will pick up, uh, pick out maybe those studies, um, you know, uh, different from, you know, uh, just a fake news, general fake news uh, study that doesn't touch upon the civic significance of uh, this particular issue, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the people. Okay, so I think we have two students raise uh, the questions. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, Lee Hua first, you know, he posed his questions in the chat room. And then, you know, I think Sam, you know, also raised her hand. So perhaps, you know, you address uh, Andy's question first. Sure, sure. Maybe I address uh, Lee Hua's uh, question first because yeah, 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 I yeah. saw uh, the question in the chat first. Yes, yes, that so, one, yeah. Yeah, so Li Hua, that's, uh, thank you so much. That's a great question, actually. Uh, when I uh, decide to work on the, the civic tech issues, like the topic, and somehow become an advocate for civic tech, you know, I also have to reflect on uh, my choice, right? Uh, well, uh, uh, is this uh, true that civic tech is always good, is always fantastic, or there's, there's nothing wrong about civic tech? There are no uh, uh, downsides of uh, civic tech. Definitely not, right? Every phenomenon is complicated. Uh, every fifth phenomenon has its downsides. Um, so when it comes to civic tech, you know, let me maybe just give you a few examples of the possible downsides. Right? So first, um, civic, you know, when we develop tech, um, tech can fail. Right? Uh, it's not that uh, the, the government's uh, tech can fail. You know, everyone's tech can <laughs> fail, right? Even a company's tech can fail, right? Uh, so civic tech is... Uh, indeed actually uh, can fail as well, right? Um, basically, you know, the tech doesn't work, right? It doesn't work as uh, it is expected to be, right? Um, so if you look at uh, the Japanese uh, Cocoa, right? The Cocoa uh, uh, official app, uh, you know, draws uh, resources from the uh, Code for Japan uh, app, right? Um, but uh, if you search for Japanese uh, media reports on Cocoa, there are many reports uh, accusing that, you know, the tech doesn't do its job, right? Doesn't actually trace the context uh, very precisely. So yeah, that's one, probably one downside of civic tech. That means um, with uh, not, without maybe um, a, a huge uh, kind of uh, government behind it, a uh, huge amount of money behind it, like other industry uh, leaders, right? So it's possible that uh, due to lack of resource, right? Uh, and manpower, civic tech may fail, right? So that's um, one downside I see from it. Um, another downside uh, is something I learned from uh, basically joining, <laughs> joining and uh, observing uh, the civic tech communities themselves, right? So um, as um, many, actually, uh, there are studies on hacker and mover, uh, mover, uh, maker movement uh, that suggests that although these communities are driven by very idealistic um, visions, right? But the communities are also human societies, right? There are lots of power dynamics and also uh, lots of uh, social injustice and inequalities you can see in these communities, right? So what I mean is even civic tech communities might be driven by uh, voluntary, uh, need, uh, voluntary uh, purposes, right? That want to benefit uh, the society it doesn't mean that the communities are running without any potential problems, right? So they are small societies as well. You will see in, in the circle of uh, coders, right? You will see uh, a gender imbalance, for instance, right? Most of the, uh, the people actually are male uh, programmers, right? Uh, and female perspectives may uh, be very difficult to, to penetrate into this kind of community, right? So by just naming these two downsides, I would like to, um, yeah, to, to say that um, I, I, I know, I'm aware that uh, 
civic tech as a phenomenon, right, has definitely its own uh, problems, right? And that's precisely the reason why we want to study it very carefully, right? So before, you know, pointing a finger probably to either the government or the industry, we have to be aware that civic tech is not perfect either, right? Just like a gov tech, just like industry tech, right? So, but there are certain things about civic tech that uh, the governments or industry or the companies don't really have or don't really prioritize, right? Um, in their own technological development. And that's uh, still very valuable. Now I see why were you, your research involved toward this direction, because you can see that actually in a large chunk of, you know, the explanations would still be rooted in political communication, but just that, you know, the applications now, you know, involve, you know, um, you know uh, technology. So now I see like, you know, the clear, you know, connection between your previous research and then your <laughs> new research agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Uh, those uh, venues, right? Those uh, uh, deliberative democracy uh, work, we, we worked together, right? I think these are guiding venues uh, that mm -hmm. uh, serve as foundations of examining uh, these different phenomena and all, you know, basically the mess of it, right? The messy reality mm -hmm. uh, of civic tech, right? Okay, so yes, we have change. Abby, oh. Abby here, right? And I think Sam, or oh, Abby, sorry, uh, I, I keep saying Sam, but then that's Abby, yeah, sorry, it's Abby okay. raising the camera. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful talk. I've learned a lot uh, from your sharing. And I have two questions. Uh, so first, it's about, it's kind of relevant to Li Hua's question just now. It's about um, techno solutionism. I think that's a potential, like, um, criticism faced by, um, technologies that try to solve our problems. And mm -hmm. especially in your uh, example uh, for Singapore's government technology, it mm -hmm. sort of feels like uh, some of the technologies are solving problems, but meanwhile, um, excluding certain people from, uh, from that benefit. Uh, so I wonder uh, from your research, how do you think um, civic tech answer this, pro uh, this question or is civic tech by definition, like tech for good, is it just by definition exclude this kind of question from consideration? And also um, uh, my second question is about method uh, because uh, the, the database you searched as uh, a database about of um, academic research articles. But uh, I think now we have a lot of uh, civic tech that is just um, not oriented towards research, but oriented towards um, ap real world application. So maybe they're not published as papers. So uh, if we're going to study this uh, kind of civic tech, um, do you have any thoughts on how to do the sampling or uh, things like that uh, efficiently? And uh, finally, it's also a relevant question is about um, uh, blockchain, because uh, like recently we have a lot of blockchain technologies that uh, claim to promote um, democratic deliberation and everything, but it turns out to be kind of like one stake, one vote rather than one person, one vote. And uh, this is also the reason why I was asking about techno solutionism. So uh, I'm, I'm really wondering like your take on those kind of emerging civic technology as well. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. You know, these are fabulous questions. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> Leah, you guys have really, really, really good uh, students over there. Um, so uh, techno, uh, techno uh, solutionism, you know, uh, I, I, I thank you for bringing up this very critical uh, concept and as well as a question as well. Um, well, um, I don't know, you know, I, I feel that my answer is going to be very practical. <laughs> not as academic as uh, probably not academic enough <laughs> because when you move from um, doing research to uh, tackling uh, real life challenges to or to practices um, you know i realize that uh, it's easy to to criticize uh, than uh, to 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 build right <laughs> so techno solutionism let me uh, share with you my understanding of techno uh, solutionism, the problem of it, right? 
So the problem of it uh, mostly lies in that uh, people say, um, if you uh, use, you know, you emphasize uh, tech, right? You are only emphasizing uh, using tools to superficially kind of uh, address uh, problems ad hocly, you know, uh, without even uh, touching upon the fundamental uh, issues, right? So most of the time, these uh, fundamental issues are referred to as structural issues <coughs> rooted in maybe political, uh, political structure. And sometimes it also even refers to the economic structure, the capitalist systems we are in right now, right? So uh, this uh, criticism basically says that you don't address deep-rooted structural problems. You only use technological tools to somehow grow you know, over the surface of the problem. Uh, my take on that is if we really can change the structural problems, why not, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, if you uh, think that, you know, structural problems can be changed, I think we will all go change it, right? <laughs> uh, they are structure uh, precisely because uh, it's easy to change, right? And we all somehow are uh, a part of the system. Uh, so uh, that's why um, my take is, you know, that if we can use technological uh, tools to somehow alleviate some of these problems, right? Um, and that's what we're uh, able to do now. Uh, let's do it. Uh, for those who are really able to address the structural uh, problems, yeah, please go ahead. Nobody, nobody wants to uh, stop uh, people from doing that, right? Uh, it's really that uh, it doesn't mean that if uh, a practice uh, that cannot contribute to solving the deep-rooted problems then uh, the practice is meaningless, is useless, right? Um, I don't think uh, that's the case. So it's more maybe one side of my answer. Another side of my answer is, is this, right? So when we talk about structure, as if uh, the structure is fixed, is, um, is uh, your dominant power over there, always there, right? Um, we, we also forget that, um, you know, what Anthony Giddens has said, uh, about structuration, right? So practice is precisely our daily practice that somehow feeds back into these uh, structure, right? So to somehow uh, support the stru stru structure, right? So I'm thinking uh, when we uh, develop technologies, right? And through these uh, teeny tiny uh, uh, moments of practices, we may have already somehow revised what the structure uh, uh, requested or required us to do, or or even somehow, you know, uh, basically make the structure invalid uh, in that particular moment, right? So I value this kind of uh, teeny tiny moments as well. Although uh, the moments may not last until uh, a fun fundamental change in the, uh, in the structure, but at, at least I think they are also uh, valuable resistance, <laughs> uh, you know, ordinary people can, can make, right, in their daily life. So these are the two uh, takes uh, I have regarding techno solutionism. Um, and another related question, your, your last question, I think, is also related to, to this. Uh, is, is, it has a completely different uh, kind of uh, dimension, right? So that one basically says, uh, how can you uh, be sure that all the technologies you build are actually good, <laughs> right? You claim they are good, right? Uh, you claim that they are benefiting the state citizens, then we realize that you know it's just a talk, right? Or it's just you say that. Um, well, uh, my uh, take on that is uh, I kind of agree. I totally agree. Uh, and uh, when I say I agree, uh, I I also don't want to uh, so-called point a finger to certain people like blockchain. I don't want to say the blockchain people are evil, they're cheating us, right? Or, or I also don't want to see the artificial uh, people, artificial intelligence people tell us, you know, uh, uh, all the lies, right? Um, well, when these technologies promote for a piece of technology, uh, they might be sincerely believing in uh, their benefits. But uh, what I have learned from uh, my del deliberation work with Lian, right, before, it's basically that uh, as human beings, our, our perspective is always limited, right? 
Uh, so when I see a piece of new technology as an inventor of the technology, I probably only see the good sides of it. And I'll tell the world about the good sides of it, but I don't see all the potential problems with a piece of technology. So uh, the part of my presentation on participatory mechanism and design model, I think might be particularly relevant to this particular, this question you asked. I think all the technologies just, right? or uh, the technological development needs to somehow incorporate deliberation <laughs> into their design, really. Uh, you know, if they are able to open their, uh, the design uh, discussion to citizens, uh, various uh, citizens, right, with different kinds of backgrounds and perspectives, they may be able to detect the blind, uh, the blind spots in their own uh, de uh, technological development at the early stage, right? Not until uh, all the algorithm uh, is already written up, the AI has already been developed, then we realize that, oops, oh, I didn't no notice that there is this uh, significant downside uh, to the technology, right? So um, that's, that's uh, something I hope the future technologists can, can embrace. And I think that's fundamentally a civic value, basically. Being open to different perspectives and willing to engage with uh, perspectives is a fundamental civic value. That's why uh, I still think that civic tech as a concept has uh, a particularly kind of relevant uh, point here, right? Um, all right, uh, okay, the last question, your, your method uh, question. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you that, uh, you know, there must be tons of uh, non-academic civic tech uh, projects out there. Right, um, but this paper we have, uh, uh, or this study we have done really just focused on the academic uh, sides of it. It could be really just a very small portion of all the civic tech uh, projects we have out there. Um, so um, if we want to uh, have a kind of a review of all the real world practices, I have to admit that first it's gonna be difficult, right? and uh, um, very unlikely to be com comprehensive, right? Uh, because there's so many things going on. Uh, second, if we really want to uh, have a look, you know, uh, there's this website I just mentioned, the civictech.guide, right? Might be a good starting point. I actually had, had a look at the website. I had a talk with uh, the website uh, owner as well. Um, you will see that um, because their cases are both uh, so-called entered by the website owner himself, who is located in the United States, right? And uh, is, uh, volunteered by, voluntary, uh, voluntarily entered by the civic tech developers, right? You can imagine those who have access to the website uh, are also more likely to be people like uh, uh, us, right? Who are located in uh, areas or, or regions that have relatively more international or uh, global kind of uh, connections. So, um, you know, that, you know, even using that website, I'm afraid that uh, we, we won't be able to capture many Asian or non-Western or support so -called cases from the global side, South, right? So, uh, and you, we may, uh, you know, uh, end up with an incomplete uh, picture about the phenomenon. Yeah, but, you know, I agree with your basic point that, uh, yeah, we need, maybe other kinds of data sources for the real world practices. Yeah. Uh, well, you, I think Li Hua has a uh, follow-up question. So can yes. you quickly address that, please? About the relationship between civic tech and commercialization. That's a great question as well. Okay, so um, we used to think that uh, civic uh, needs to be free, right? Volunteer-based and free. Uh, well, it's uh, actually indeed the case that many people who work in the civic tech uh, space, they are volunteers, right? That means they have two identities. One of their identity is an employee working at uh, Facebook, <laughs> uh, and they make money there, right? But somehow they also embrace another uh, identity. That's basically citizen, right? Concerned citizen or capable citizen who can contribute through technological development, right? So that's why uh, they are volunteering for, uh, for, for the community. Um, but uh, at first, I also 
thought that uh, maybe uh, civic tech means uh, voluntary, <laughs> means uh, uh, nonprofit. Uh, but after talking to the civic technologists from the community themselves, like people like Hong Fa Dang, right, the FOSS Asia funder, uh, then I realized that um, it's actually not good for the civic tech uh, community itself if we completely exclude the possibility of commercialization and profit making, right? Uh, it's basically that, you know, can you imagine an open source uh, uh, community, all their softwares are open. Anyone who has a cap capacity to read their codes can use their codes, right? So uh, their codes have been used by commercial companies widely, but the companies never pay them, <laughs> never pay them for the open codes. So they are doing things, uh, these things uh, basically for, not, for, for not, no uh, income at all. Um, then uh, when, thing, when major crises uh, such as the pandemic hit, right, you will see, um, you know, a real challenge for them to sustain the community, right? So uh, Hong Fa Dang actually told me that uh, she is considering to commercialize uh, FOSS Asia. FOSS Asia as an organization now is registered as a private company. Okay, so um, what can I say? Um, I don't necessarily uh, now see uh, civic tech and commercialization as like two binaries, right? Um, you know, possible that civic tech has to uh, incorporate co commercialization simply uh, to, to sustain itself, right? Uh, and commercialization may, or the commercial side of the technological world may also be able to contribute to uh, the civic tech development. So that's my current understanding of the of the two things now. Okay, so Wei Yu, you mentioned that earlier, you mentioned you have a meeting at two. So yes, I think- Yes, yes, actually it's right now. <laughs> right. I have so a staff I think, meeting to go. <laughs> right, uh, but then, you know, we can keep you for, you know, one more minute for, uh, for us to, you know, uh, to wrap up and then to thank you again for uh, sharing this very, uh, uh, you know, very uh, inspiring talk. Okay, and, uh, um, so earlier where you showcase, you know, some of the initial research they did in Singapore and in Japan. And I know that many of our students are interested in doing research in mainland China. So if you want to become a pioneer, you know, researchers, okay, in the area of, you know, civil tech, okay, so please, you know, join her, okay, to explore this concept a little bit more. And uh, um, so I think, you know, that will be what, you know, we learn from, you know, today's class about like, you know, some of the potential, you know, uh, topics that we can do and then some of, you know, you know, the uh, studies that have been, you know, uh, um, uh, classified us within, you know, this, you know, uh, area, very exciting area. So thanks again, Wei Yu, for, you know, uh, spending your time, you know, with us to, you know, uh, you know very generously, okay, share with us your research, you know, our uh, work. And then uh, I wish everybody a very happy, you know, uh, Chinese New Year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Again. you. Okay. Happy, thank you. Happy again. New Year. Happy Chinese New Year. Happy weekend. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. I'll end the meeting now. Okay. So thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.